It is Friday, January 5th, and this is The National. Tonight, a well-known Canadian faces new allegations of sexual misconduct, including rape. Oscar winner Paul Haggis denies all. Nova Scotians have a lot to fix up outside after a bomb cyclone of weather lived up to its name. And the latest dispatches from the battle over a rising minimum wage and who is forced to bear the sudden cost. But we begin with a dramatic scene tonight at Toronto's Pearson Airport. Those panicked voices you hear are passengers on board a WestJet flight, just returning from Cancun, waiting to approach the gate. That fire, you see, broke out after the plane was hit by a Sunwing jet being towed on the tarmac. Now, that plane was empty, but the WestJet flight sure wasn't. Oh, my God. 174 passengers and crew on board that WestJet flight. They all had to escape by emergency slide. They say there might be minor injuries at this point, but the airport authority is still investigating. And of course, we're going to keep you posted as that situation changes. Now the latest on the Tim Horton story. Earlier this week, CBC News first reported how some franchisees are cutting workers' hours and benefits in response to an increase in the minimum wage in Ontario. You may have seen the debate that touched off in social media. And today we learned the owner of four Tim Hortons in St. Thomas, Ontario, is telling workers they will no longer get one free uniform a year, a cost of up to $100 a year, according to one worker, and they can no longer take home a free hot beverage at the end of their shift. But today, the company that owns Tim Hortons made it clear it doesn't support what some of its franchisees are doing. In a statement, head office said, Tim Hortons team members should never be used to further an agenda or be treated as just an expense. This is completely unacceptable. As a national brand, that is part of Canadians' daily routine. Tim Hortons is a powerful symbol in this debate, but it's affecting many other employers as well. And tonight, Jacqueline Hansen starts our coverage with one of Tim's competitors, which is turning to customers to pay more. The owner of this downtown Toronto coffee shop is bracing for the worst. Struggling to pay rent down here anyway, now I can't. Within a few months from now, I will be closed. Ontario's minimum wage hike will have to come out of customers' pockets. Prices here are going up 22%. We've had two customers already leave and say Tim Hortons hasn't raised their rates. So we're losing business because of this. Tim Hortons franchisees are contractually forbidden from raising prices, but some are taking other controversial actions. CBC News has now learned several cut paid breaks and clawed back contributions toward employee benefits. We agreed to disguise this employee's voice. There's not much we can do about it. We risk losing our job and they're not that easy to get. On Twitter, boycott Tim Hortons is trending. The reputation of the iconic Canadian brand seemingly at risk. In a statement to CBC, Tim Hortons said it saddens all of us to see that jeopardized by the actions of a reckless few. But it offered no suggestions as to how store owners can make up the difference. Ontario Premier Kathleen Wynne and her government are standing behind the new $14 minimum wage. She will not be swayed by business owners, some of whom are very wealthy, to back away from her passion of caring for those that are less fortunate. I expect the same from Ontario business leaders, most of whom I know get it. This small coffee shop is raising wages even higher than the province is requiring, to $14.75. I don't understand why a large business such as Tim Hortons wouldn't be able to do the same for their workers. The cost? Prices for customers are going up 10%, or about a quarter on a cup of coffee. I don't mind. It doesn't bother me at all. I appreciate the service, and I think um, everyone has to make a living. A careful balance that other Ontario businesses will also have to find. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. As we've seen, Tim Hortons is a lightning rod in any discussion of low-paid jobs. We know how much the minimum wage is going up in Ontario and how some franchisees are reacting, but you may be wondering, how much do those franchisees make? 
Well, for some insight into Tim Hortons, we're joined by Douglas Hunter. You wrote the book Double Double, came out a few years ago, a really fascinating insight into a corporation that so many of us think we know, but we mm -hmm. don't really know the details. So, so let me ask you, how much does a franchisee of an average Tim Hortons make? Well, an ideal uh, franchise, say it makes about $2 million a year in Canada. That would be a nice target for a standard operating uh, store. Um, the targets that franchisees work, would work towards, and this is within the last couple of years, would be to try to make about 13% on the gross income before tax and then pay themselves a manager's because they're on site running the thing they as a manager they would pay themselves maybe maybe another four percent um so you're looking at something in the three four hundred thousand dollar pre-tax and what i try to tell people too not to apologize for the franchisees but in addition to paying taxes on that they also have to be prepared to reinvest in the franchise over say the 10-year period of of the franchise that they have, they may part, as you know from yeah. the research you did in your book. Yeah. But still, three hundred to four hundred thousand yeah. dollars. You yeah. know, there are a lot of people in Canada who yeah. look at that and say, "So franchisees are complaining about right. a small, depending on your perspective, right. increase in the minimum wage." Hortons is a real is a real top top quality, but also top down system. You know, they provide you the food. They don't just provide you guidance on what kind of food you where you buy it. It's like, no, you we make the donuts for you. It's our brand of coffee. Uh, the machinery comes from us. There's a playbook. There's a system. And that's why you're attracted to it as a franchisee. But to make the system work and execute, you don't have a whole lot you control the costs on. And what you do have control over is is basically wages, which is, other than that, it's really, it's wastage. It's like, how many serviettes do you go through and how much food do you waste? by making too much on a particular day. So, you know, the, the wage element is a very significant part of how they manage making their profitability. We have just thing, when you look at this controversy in the last 48 hours or so with Tim Hortons and the minimum wage, what do you think this is doing to the brand? Well, it's, it's the main concern for people that have some investment in the brand, which is both the franchisees and the franchisor, because the people, the customers, have a relationship with the company that's not only the cup they hold in their hand, but it's the people they're looking at across the counter or through the drive through window. And if they start to feel uncomfortable about what role they're playing in, if they start to feel exploitive that, you know, I'm in here and I'm buying for this company, but this poor person is not being paid or treated the way I felt, I don't, I don't really comfortable in this situation anymore. And I think I'm going to try to get this coffee over McDonald's or somewhere else. And that's where the brand value uh, reputation starts to uh, deteriorate. Well, I read your book when it came out. It's fascinating. I recommend it to others. And, and thank you very much for speaking with us. Well, thanks for having me in. One final note on jobs. The Canadian economy has started 2018 on a high, with the national jobless rate hitting a four-decade low. It now stands at 5.7%. That is the lowest rate since 1976. It fell two-tenths of a percentage point in December alone, thanks to the creation of almost 80,000 jobs, a number that defied most analysts' expectations. Well, Adrian, lots of big stories uh, tonight, including yet another major Hollywood figure accused of rape. This one is about Canadian director Paul Haggis. A civil lawsuit filed last month accusing the Oscar-winning filmmaker of rape has just been amended to include allegations of sexual misconduct from three other women. Haggis, who was born in London, Ontario, has denied all of it. Salima Shivji has the details. And the Oscar goes to... Crash! Paul Haggis, the first screenwriter to win back-to-back -back Oscars for Crash and Million Dollar Baby. Fraser. Fraser. Fred Fraser. Oh, dear. Creator of the Canadian television series Due South, now stands accused of rape and sexual assault. Haley Breest, a publicist, filed a civil lawsuit last month, alleging the filmmaker lured her to his Manhattan apartment and raped her nearly five years ago. She was petrified and felt terrified, the lawsuit says, as he became sexually aggressive. She repeatedly told him no. Haggis quickly denied the allegation. He filed his own lawsuit, accusing the woman of extortion. Now three more women have come forward anonymously. One alleges Haggis pushed her onto the floor of an office and raped her. A second woman accuses the filmmaker of attempted assault, a third of forcibly kissing her on a street corner. Their claims have been added to the original lawsuit, which now states the experiences of these additional women and Ms. Breest make clear that Paul Haggis is a serial predator who has preyed upon women for many years. Haggis released a statement through his lawyer saying Mr. Haggis denies these anonymous claims in whole. Well his statement also mentions Scientology. Uh, if I leave, I leave loudly. 
Haggis has been vocal about his break from the Church of Scientology, and he questions whether that played a role in the sexual assault allegations. According to the Associated Press, the women say they're not connected to Scientology. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Toronto. Now, towing the party line was never Senator Lynn Bayek's strong suit. Her defense of the residential school system exasperated her colleagues. A new controversy has now exhausted the patience of the Conservative leader. As David Cochran reports, her rogue ways paving the way for her banishment. Senator Bayek, can we just ask... The Conservative leadership has tolerated Lynn Bayek's past intolerance, defending Canada's notorious residential school system. I don't need any more education. I've been involved since we double dated when I was 15 with an Aboriginal fellow and his wife. Bayek insisted her views were correct, even widely held. There was two sides to every story. We have 700 letters we're making a binder and we'll make it all available. And that was her undoing. She posted hundreds of those letters on her website. At least one contained language conservative leader Andrew Scheer called racist. It called indigenous people lazy. I demanded Senator Bayak remove this content from her website. She refused. As a result of her actions, I have removed Bayak from the Conservative National Caucus. Lynn Bayak isn't returning calls, but her son, Nick Bayak, is, launching a staunch defense of his mother and an attack on Andrew Scheer. The majority of Canadians agree with the comment, Andrew Scheer. It's disgraceful that there's people in that level of power that have that lack of courage. And Canadians deserve better. Andrew Scheer isn't doing interviews, but the implication from Scheer's statement is that Bayak could have stayed in the caucus if she had simply followed his orders and removed the offending letter, raising questions as to whether this expulsion was as much about insubordination as it was racism. Scheer's office won't say if Bayak could have stayed if she removed the letters, a spokesman saying he wouldn't answer hypotheticals. As to why this final straw looks a lot like the previous straws, Shear's office had this to say. There's a fine line between espousing distasteful views on a public policy position and willingly promoting unacceptable racist comments. I think it's a decision that they probably could have made many months ago when this first uh, started up, and I'm not surprised. And In fact, I think it's a good move. The NDP goes further. Her race baiting is unacceptable, asking the Prime Minister to reach out to independent senators to use their tools to have her removed. But the likelihood of that is low. Bayak hasn't committed any crimes. Short of that, there's no way to force her out. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Her opinions may be unorthodox and unpopular, but Lynn Bayak isn't shy about sharing them. Mistakes were made at residential schools, in many instances horrible mistakes that overshadowed some good things that also happened at those schools. That was Bayek last year. Critics say her candy-coated views trivialized the trauma and indignities experienced by residential school survivors, prompting her removal from the Senate's Aboriginal People's Committee. Then last August, an open letter on her website to First Nations. Trade your status card for a Canadian citizenship with a fair and negotiated payout to each Indigenous man, woman and child in Canada. Well, that saw Bayak removed from three other Senate committees and led to calls for her resignation, calls which are being renewed again tonight. And Andrew, obviously we're going to continue to press for some more answers on this, but you are keeping an eye on that cleanup in Atlanta, Canada. Yeah, Adrian, uh, folks there have a lot of experience with big storms, but this one was a doozy for even the hardiest of them. In some places, the so-called bomb cyclone brought heavy snow, but in Nova Scotia, it was the hurricane force wind and powerful storm surges which forced people to batten down the hatches. And today, they emerged to survey the damage. Kayla Hounsel is there. Along Nova Scotia's south shore today, the wind is still whipping up the ocean. Overnight, the waves literally swept in over the beach, throwing rocks all over the road and lifting the road itself. Today, it's in pieces like a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, I've seen it bad before, but I don't think ever this bad. This is quite a mess. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Hugh Burns is in charge of putting this mess back together. This 
combined water, strength of the water and the wind and the rocks. This, this whole area flooded. You're not going to fix it today, but how are you going to fix it? We're going to remove the asphalt, the broken asphalt. Basically leave it as a gravel road for the rest of the season. The rest of the winter, we'll fix it next summer. People who live nearby had a front row seat to a very powerful storm. No, we could see no, the debris coming across on the lake. We could feel it, like the house rumbles. We're just watching everything blow around and hoping that our roof was going to stay on. Fortunately, there was no damage to their home. But down the road, wind and water knocked over power poles. All along the coast, waves washed up over the road, and there was damage in Halifax, too. This home lost its roof, sending insulation flying all over the street. I saw the roof start to flap, and eventually I saw the entire front piece of the roof just lift off and land in the road and hit one of our employees' cars. At Peggy's Cove, the ocean churned up white caps, making that iconic lighthouse look tiny. I really enjoy the watching the power that nature has. People don't have much respect for that anymore, but when you're down here, you certainly do. The cost of this damage along the coast is still being tallied. People who live here say it's the price of living by the ocean. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Queensland, Nova Scotia. Oh yeah, it's beautiful water for snowmobile. I find it's it's really windy though. Oh, I love being out in water like this. I'm always out when, when, when there's a snowstorm, you'll see me out on the skidoo. <laughs> well, some like it, some don't, but uh, either way, people are digging out right across Atlantic Canada. This is the scene in Newfoundland and Labrador, just blanketed in snow. A storm surge and snow warnings still in effect in some parts. I put my head down to have a little afternoon nap for about 30 minutes or so. I woke up and it was all there. And this is video from Charlottetown PEI. The frozen waterfront pushed a huge pile of ice chunks onto the shore. The winds are still quite high across the province, but they've managed to restore power to most people. And it is that rebuilding, trying to get back to normal. That's the big story in the United States right now. The worst of the wild weather is over there, but it's left quite a mess behind. Check out this mountain of snow. A lot of digging going on in Boston, and it's cold work there. Temperatures dipping down to the minus 30s. This weekend is going to be dangerously cold, so we're asking people, other than going out to shovel, we're asking you to stay inside as much as possible. Also, remember yesterday's intense storm surge in Situate, Massachusetts? Well, here's what's left of the seawall. And some of those flooded Boston streets are now frozen. As for all those cancelled and delayed flights, we sat on the tarmac, I think, for something like four and a half hours. The airlines are trying to catch up today, but it is an uphill battle. Hopefully we can get on a train, but if not, New York's a pretty good place to be stuck in. And uh, we have lots more ahead for you tonight on The National. We are going to take you south of the border to Buffalo for Canada's chance at World Junior Gold. And some of this country's top curlers are getting a second shot at their Olympic dreams, and it's all thanks to a new event in the sport. We'll explain. And the book creating a political sensation is out tonight. Fire and fury flying off the shelves. And Donald Trump, well, he really isn't happy about it. And of course, we are following that developing and, and pretty scary story in Toronto. A WestJet flight full of passengers waiting on the tarmac being hit by another plane that was being towed at Pearson Airport. The very latest on that situation, next on The National.
on The National tonight. We are tracking that plane fire at Toronto's Pearson Airport. It broke out after a Sunwing aircraft clipped a WestJet plane on the tarmac. 174 passengers and crew were on board the WestJet flight. They had to escape by emergency slide. There's an emergency uh, just on the ramp there, there's people running around of an aircraft on fire, just hold there. So that audio is from air traffic control at Pearson after the WestJet plane was struck. The airport authority says it is investigating and of course, we will be watching for other developments. Also tonight, a Canadian Holocaust denier has been arrested in Germany, according to Jewish advocacy group B'nai B'rith Canada. They say they'd filed complaints with German authorities over her views. Monica Schaefer, is a former Green Party candidate from Alberta who notoriously posted a video online in 2016 denying the Holocaust. In Germany, where B'nai B'rith says police arrested her, that's a crime. Human rights are not the gift of governments. They are the inalienable right of the people themselves. The U.S. reaffirming its support of anti-government protesters in Iran. This is at an emergency session of the United Nations Security Council. And it's a meeting that has pitted the U.S. against Russia. They're supposed to be discussing the week of protests and unrest, but the Kremlin has stood by its ally, Iran, accusing the U.S. of abusing its position and interfering in Iran's internal affairs. That explosive tell-all book about Donald Trump's first year in office hit bookstores today, and it's already a bestseller. It seems everybody's talking about it, except for Trump himself. Should Steve Bannon be fired? Should Steve Bannon be fired, sir? Michael Wolff's fire and fury paints a damning picture of the U.S. president. It includes the views of administration insiders, some of whom question his fitness for office. Trump tried to block publication, claiming the book is full of lies, but his legal threats may have boosted sales. Our Keith Bogue has more on the claims inside the cover. Okay, but you're taking two. Clearly, the president's last-minute legal maneuvers couldn't keep the book off the shelves, and it was snapped up. Big league. From what I've read so far, it's um, terrifying. Is it fake news? Is it something someone wanted to put out? I don't know. But um, I'm definitely going to read it and I'm going to talk about it. What the book says the people around Donald Trump believe about the president is indeed worrisome. They say he's um, a, a moron, an idiot. Author Michael Wolff laid out what even Trump's supporters, friends and family say. The one description that that everyone gave, everyone has in common. They all say he is like a child. The president said the book is full of lies and his supporters went to bat for him, arguing that if it isn't entirely true, then you can't believe any of it. The question is, if 10% isn't true, if 20% isn't true, if uh. 30%, what is the reader supposed to guess? What is accurate and what isn't? My credibility is being questioned by a man who has less credibility than perhaps anyone who has ever walked on earth at this point. Steve Bannon, Trump's former campaign chair and strategic advisor, is the source for some of the most damaging material in the book. But Joshua Green, who wrote his own book on Bannon and Trump called Devil's Bargain, says don't be fooled into thinking Bannon was being cleverly strategic. No, I think the big mistake that people will make in reading this book, I've seen some of this on television, is people saying, oh, well, there was some clever strategy here. Bannon was doing X, Y, and Z. Uh, the only thing Bannon was doing was, was nursing his own ego and uh, gi giving vent to his own view of the people inside the Trump administration, including the president himself, in a way uh, that has sealed his political fate. There have been many books about Trump, but this one seems to have found a particular audience. I heard that it pissed the president off, so I decided to buy it. Within hours, it had shot to the top of Amazon and Barnes & Noble's bestsellers lists. Normally, that's right where Trump likes to be. Keith Bogue, CBC News, Washington. When we come back, Canadians cheer on their team at the World Juniors gold medal game in Buffalo. And some of Canada's top curlers are competing tonight for a spot at the Winter Games. But first, they have to figure out how this new Olympic sport works. There's no set script on how to play this game yet. It is fast, it's intense, so it's a little more physically and mentally demanding on these teams.
Across Canada this past week, it's been bargain hunting time in the stores, and the sight of those customers was good news for retailers who haven't had the strong repeat of Christmas 85 that they'd all been expecting. Store owners say that they see a shift in our buying habits. The customers know the sales are coming. They wait for them. As Linda Sims reports, there's one group of stores that's racking up record profits by catering to bargain mania all year round. His prices are so low, any day he'll be broke. Honest, that is his name. He's Sales are soaring at Toronto's original bargain basement emporium. Honest Ed's has always made big money by catering to those with little money. But now it's making even more by going upscale. There's been trade up in every area in our jewelry department. We've traded up in watches and everything. And I think we do this because it's selling. People, are, people want it, they're buying it, and we supply it. Yes. The bargain basements all decked out with high priced sports equipment, VCRs, and fancy chandeliers. All there to lure in that savvy new middle class shopper out looking for a deal. There's profits to be made at the bottom of the market, and that's uh, what, the, what the recession showed us. What the recession showed a lot of Canadians was the importance of stretching that shopping dollar. Consumers learned to search out good value at low prices. The recession may be over, but the appetite for a bargain has stuck. It's a huge potential market. Over half of all Canadians make under $30,000 a year and plenty who make more love a deal. These customers used to shop at the major department stores, but now the discount department stores are luring them away. Zellers, for example. It used to live between the major department stores and the deep discounters. Today, Zellers is moving upscale, snaring the traditional department store customer by keeping prices low. Uh, the only way that we can really survive is market share. And everything that we do is really geared to, to predatory st strategic activities against our competitors. How do we steal market share from them, basically? Remember the traditional Zellers variety store? Well, just look at Zellers now. This is one of their model stores of the future in Pointe Claire, Quebec. The merchandise is much the same. What's different is the look. Okay. By investing money in sharpening its image, Zellers is gambling that the new look will pull in more customers. That higher sales volume, in turn, will let Zellers keep its prices lower than the mainline department stores. Are you a Zellers customer? That strategy of selling high style and low prices is played out in Zellers high class ad campaign, Pitching Club Z, a modern day trading stamp program that's cost the company over $20 million. Zellers isn't alone. Pick up a Vogue magazine and you'll find Jacqueline Smith plugging Kmart. Yes, Kmart. It's another mass merchandiser that bet it could steal department store market share by heading upscale. The shift worked. Bringing in designer clothes and using mannequins, a first for Kmart, has pulled in fashion-conscious middle-class customers. But there was a risk, driving away the old clientele. Attention shoppers, it's Who are the Nadals? Exiles of society living atop an unforgiving island. Who are the Nadeaux? Descendants from the blood of mutineers left alone to satisfy their strange desires. Who are the Nadeaux? A spellbinding story that will leave you breathless. The Nadeaux of Duquesne Island, an unforgettable achievement in modern filmmaking so extraordinary, you won't believe your eyes. Moves it across the line. In comes Solon Walker and he shoots the Well, that's Sweden tying things up just a few moments ago, shortly after Canada drew first blood at the World Junior Hockey Championships in Buffalo. Uh, worth noting, when Canada was up 1-0, it had been the first time Sweden trailed behind the entire tournament, but clearly that didn't last all that long. Our Greg Ross is at the big game. So, Greg, a gold medal at stake. How's it feeling over there? Because attendance has been a struggle at these games, but not tonight. Not tonight at all, Andrew. In fact, it's a sea of red in there. Canadian fans 
flocking across the border to come and watch this game tonight. And I think that's what tournament organizers were hoping for when they brought this trip back to Buffalo. But uh, for a number of reasons, there's been a lack of interest. Uh, one of the reasons is high ticket prices. People have also pointed to the fact that this tournament has been in southern Ontario the last two years. Maybe a lack of interest because of that. Uh, but with Canada going for gold, I think fans are hungry to be here and to see it in person. And it seems like everybody showed up here at the Key Bank Centre at the same time. Take a look at this scene just moments before puck drop as everybody tried to get into the building at the same time. It's kind of like they just opened up Southern Ontario and they all flooded in here. Oh, absolutely. And we're here to support Canada every, every step of the way. Oh, you've been here the whole tournament? The whole tournament, yeah. It, it's nothing, the, it hasn't been anything like this the no, whole Not the whole tournament, but this is great. This is a great atmosphere. It's warmer in Bunch Buffalo. Of fans. It's warmer in Buffalo, that's why we came. I just met them on the train coming here. We're all cheering for Canada. Well, they were loose and relaxed before this game. They were ready to celebrate. They might be a little more tense now because of the fact that there's a nail biter happening out on the ice right now after two periods of play. This game tied at one, a very close game, and it looks like this one could go down to the wire. Now, Canada has won a lot of their games by big scores, but it looks like this one could be a close one and could go either way. So a lot of those fans, Andrew, on the edge of their seats. Yeah, it makes it that much more exciting, that's for sure. Uh, Greg, we'll let you get back to the game. Thanks so much. That is Greg Ross at the World Junior Hockey Gold Medal game in Buffalo, New York, tonight. Yes, yes, yes. Hard. Whoa. Yes. Yeah! Hard. That's it. It's pretty good. Nice shot. And that is a little taste of the battle for another coveted prize on the ice. The first ever Canadian trials in the new Olympic event of mixed doubles curling. Teams made up of top players, among them former Olympians, are competing for a spot at Pyeongchang 2018. This is an extraordinary second chance for some of Canada's best curlers to achieve their Olympic dreams after falling short in qualifying for the men's or women's competitions. But as Cameron McIntosh explains, they're all still struggling to figure it out. There are many of Canada's top curlers, men's and women's Grand Slam, world and Olympic champions, teaming up in mixed pairs. Because if you're here, she comes through the whole Some high profile partnerships, others bound on and off the ice. These elite curlers all missed the cut in men's and women's play for the Olympics. Now they're vying for a second chance as Canada's entry in the new Olympic sport of mixed doubles curling. Any opportunity to go and play at the Olympics would be a lifelong dream for anyone. It's curling, but it varies greatly from their traditional game, and not just because it's pairs, a man and a woman. The games are shorter, each end starts with rocks already in play, so the games tend to be higher scoring. And there's music. In some ways, it feels more like a Friday teen bond spiel than an Olympic trial, but those are the stakes. Canada's best are learning it on the fly. It is fast, it's intense, so it's a little more physically and mentally demanding on these teams. Former two-time world men's champion Jeff Stoughton will coach the Olympic duo. What have you learned <laughs> so far? I've learned that it's still, there's no set script on how to play this game yet. Here, I've still seen world and Canadian champions standing out in the ice and going like, we're not sure what to play. Most unique, in doubles you can throw and sweep your own rocks. That's making for interesting pairings. Brad Gushu and Val Sweeting are both skips, trying to sort out who's in charge. Oh, I'm starting to be mean to her, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's being mean to me, so. That's yeah. working well. Yeah, we <laughs> Meanwhile, Jennifer Jones' gold medal team from the last Olympics are all here playing against each other. Does it matter to, that it would be as a mixed doubles? It would be pretty special to be a part of the first mixed doubles Olympics. There are even a few husband and wife teams. <laughs> you're good, you're good. Relax. 
the duo of Tuck and Tuck, eliminated early, almost. were must-see TV. If it's in, take it to the forefoot. I'm not that good. It might be taken as harsh at home, but it's definitely joking between the two of us. We like to egg each other on. Stoughton says he's ready for anything. How would you feel going to the Olympics coaching a married couple? Um, it might be a little more difficult. Playoffs go through the weekend. Canada's first mixed doubles Olympic team will be determined in a final match on Sunday. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Portage La Prairie, Manitoba. We have a lot more still ahead on The National tonight, but first, take a look at this. Niagara Falls are utterly spectacular right now. The wind and cold have created some stunning crystal sculptures, even if the water is simply too fast and powerful to freeze completely. But in nearby Hamilton, there are some smaller waterfalls, popular locally, and they have frozen solid, allowing people to get an up-close look at the more beautiful side of this current deep freeze. Damien Carson of Canmore is 24 years old. At that age, most young adults are starting new careers and looking toward the future. But Carson's athletic career is just about over, and there's a big hole in his resume, a trip to the Winter Olympics. I quit right after I'd had the best results of my career, and I couldn't afford to continue skiing, so... Carson retired from the sport of Nordic combined 10 months ago, but he couldn't stay away. Carson's taking one last shot at his Olympic dream and several shots at a system that has rarely supported him. It's been incredibly frustrating. You know, you, you go over to Europe and you're competing and you're beating skiers and you see them go home and, you know, they have a job in the army where all they do is train and get a paycheck. So, you know, that, that's very frustrating. But, you know, it's part of being Canadian. What can you do? Just keep plugging away. Carson says his living expenses are well over $1,000 a month. Most Canadian athletes competing internationally get $1,100 a month from the federal government. But athletes like Carson and others get nothing from the government because of inconsistent results. It's an Olympic sport, but we haven't had anybody in the Olympics for so long. And I mean, again, a catch-22, you need the money to get someone to the Olympics, but you don't have anybody at the Olympics to get the money. Chris Holland of Calgary has done remarkably well despite the lack of financial support. He finished third last weekend in a World Cup B event at Canada Olympic Park. Holland is the only Canadian competing regularly on the A circuit, but he's running out of chances to qualify for the 2002 Winter Olympics in Salt Lake. I think it's difficult mostly because the pool of athletes we have is so much smaller than if you look at Norway or Finland or Germany. I mean, they have just such a large base of athletes they can pull out an athlete that's been training his whole life that's better than anybody here. That's a common excuse for Canadian athletes competing in low-profile sports. But why is it that some other facilities left over from the Calgary Winter Games are producing good results? The Olympic Oval is the home of several world champions, including Katrina lemay Doan, an Olympic gold medalist in speed skating. Very few Canadians have ever been in a bobsleigh, but Pierre Luders of Edmonton has also won a gold medal at the Olympics. Some experts say that it's easier to recruit and keep athletes in bobsleigh and speed skating. The Calgary Olympic Development Association gives money to every one of those sports. COTA hands out more than $7 million a year in facilities and program grants. COTA has just announced its next legacy program. It's an ambitious plan to expand Canada Olympic Park and invest more money in sports like ski jumping and Nordic combined. If you used a simple cost-effectiveness rule, we'd all be playing soccer. You know, I mean, we, we wouldn't be involved in a lot of these sports, but the fact is that Canadians express themselves in different ways. And there are youngsters up there in the ski jump that, that have to fly. Here we have a ski jumping complex and a training environment uh, next to a city or in a city of almost a million people. Uh, we think the raw material here is outstanding. And we think there are uh, kids out there that, that, that want to jump. Andy Osadets is one of those youngsters that loves to fly. He won't be 14 until April, but he's already been ski jumping for five years. Like we're rising up and the younger guys here are really going to be the future of ski jumping. Osadets is a member of Team 2010, a group of young athletes that has already had some success internationally. They have a European coach and an aggressive attitude. With ski jumping it's more that you need to have the, the mindset to it and then you can, you can just train yourself physically over the years. 
It takes between six and eight years to develop an Olympian in ski jumping or Nordic combined. So John Mills is preaching patience. We hope that Canada will be at the top of the Olympic uh, rung in 2010. October last February to document the rush of asylum seekers crossing from the United States. As Nick tells us, they didn't foresee how real this story would suddenly become. It's getting dark, so in a couple hours, we're going to come back here. We're going to spend the night in and around here. If people cross the border, we're going to talk to them. Well, the same. The only thing I don't like is the ending. So when you say that... So I, I work with a producer named Leonardo Pelea, and in February of 2017, we had conversations about how wouldn't it be interesting, wouldn't it be um, powerful to go to the Manitoba, North Dakota border and try to see some of the people crossing into Canada, jumping the border. Emerson, Manitoba, a town of about 700 right on the border. For a growing number of desperate migrants, this little town is a kind of promised land. We thought, well, we'll try, we'll book two nights at the, the little motel in, in Emerson. That's what we did. We, we went in and we spent the day actually talking to the motel owner, talking to, to the local newspaper publisher, um, getting to know the town and, and getting the sort of vibe of the town and how people stood on this issue of people crossing the border as it was beginning to bubble up uh, across the country and people were beginning to talk about it. In the last two weeks alone, more than 50 people have risked their lives and walked across these frozen fields. You hear a lot about this being the longest undefended border in the world. This is what that looks like. When you're there in Emerson, between Emerson and North Dakota, it, it, it really hits home. It's fields, it's snow, it's ice, and more fields. It's just space, and that's the border. So we'd walk it. Uh, we went to the motel again that night, and the gentleman there said, there's no one going to cross tonight. It's, it was minus 27. The wind was howling, howling, howling. So we turned in early that night and uh, tried again the next day. The next day we went out um, in the early evening and the goal was, the idea was to spend the whole night out. We wanted to be outside as much as possible and to be on the border in case we saw someone. Um, but it was, it was cold, so by, I think it was about four in the morning, we were tired and I think we were worried about falling asleep. And we didn't want to fall asleep so we thought, okay, well, what we'll do is we'll get in the car and we'll go for a drive. I was driving, Leo's in the passenger seat, and he points out the window and goes, hey, what's that? And he told me that he saw something on the side of the road that looked like he thought it was a suitcase. I didn't see it at first. We stopped the car, we look out, and there was a man. The suitcase turned into a man. He stood up. And I think he'd been sleeping in a snowbank on, on the side of the road. And uh, so we got out of the car and approached him. And when I get closer, I realize it's a man lying in a snowbank. How's it going? What's your name? Mohammed. Mohammed? Did you just cross? Yeah. My heart was racing. I thought, How long have you I didn't know that? what to expect. I didn't really long? know who he was or what he was. And then I looked more closely and he was covered in snow. Mohammed's been out here wandering in the cold for 21 hours. Okay. What, why did you want to come to Canada? Uh, I have a problem. What's the problem? America's problem now. The people are good. We could really only see his eyes, but I think that and then looking into his eyes, you, I could sense that he was afraid. That he didn't know who we were 
and what we might do, and I guess it was it was a shock. We do have officers on the way, so just let them know that, okay? Should we put Mohammed in the car to warm up? Yeah, if you can. Oh, come with me. I had never seen someone put their whole life on the line like that before. I, I never, I mean, intellectually, I, I thought, before we went on the story, I thought, well, obviously, people are risking their lives. But I saw it, and the cold and the struggle that he'd been through. Um, I mean, I can't imagine. I want to know where Muhammad's journey started and what he's running from. But this isn't the time. Maybe if we hadn't come by, he, no one else would have come by. I hope that if people saw the image and if people saw the story, um, they can feel a little bit what, what that's like for the people who are crossing. Doesn't mean you agree with it or you disagree with it, but to feel it. One of 2017's biggest international stories was the territorial demise of ISIS, a crucial turning point, the liberation of Raqqa, which had served as the militant's de facto capital. I was part of a CBC News team that traveled to Syria for a close-up look at the barbarism and the destruction inflicted upon the people of that city and country over three long years. Jean-Francois Bisson was the video producer, and among the scarred buildings and lives, one image stands out for him. In tonight's Behind the Lens, JF tells the story of those haunting eyes behind the veil of a woman who called herself Um Ibrahim. My way of thinking about it is how can I best show what I'm seeing, what I'm living through my lens. I found that this image of the ISIS bride from the camp in Ainisa um, was very powerful because of uh, her eyes. Her eyes could just tell you so much. She was brought to um, to rock up when she was very young in her early, her early teens and was married and remarried and I believe remarried a third time to ISIS fighters unwillingly of what she told us. So has she been in touch with her family? Those eyes were just so powerful um, and I believe that taking that picture of her, her looking straight into the lens help you just feel that. I think in, in some moments you do, you, you do feel that connection through the lens and when you, when you take that picture, you'll feel it, you'll see it. Uh, in some pictures you don't right away, uh, but it, it, you know, when you do it, it is strong. Still ahead on The National, this bitter cold snap has Canadians rightly worried about the homeless. After the break, you'll meet a Hamilton man committed to helping his city's most vulnerable all year long. There's a new coat right there. Thank you. You want a sleeping bag? Here you go, bro. Thank you. Okay, you want a blanket too? How about a hat? Want a hat? God bless you. Merry Christmas. When they launched Annex C last month, it was beautiful to a lot of people on Earth too. People who will use it to broadcast pay TV. What we're in for now is a lavish coast-to-coast -coast extravaganza of pay TV commercials. From now to February 1st, there will be no escape. Get going with First Choice Pay TV. First Choice will be the new nationwide movie channel, and there's no question they're going to use the hard sell. With entertainment. These commercials cost plenty, so somebody thinks Pay TV is going to be a bonanza, and not just First Choice. All the stars under the stars. There will also be regional movie channels. They'll be selling just as hard. Super Channel, come February 1st, you can be part of it. Well, sit tight, folks, only a movie. And in addition to these regional movie channels, there will be a nationwide channel for the performing arts. That one's called C Channel. 
I have to have a, a satellite dish and I send it up to Annex C and the cable company pulls it down off the satellite, all right, scrambles the signal, sells it to you, and after, you've, after the sale is made, it gets unscrambled and you receive the signal. But receiving the signal is in itself a huge business. These people are making cable TV converters, 3,000 a day at a Gerald plant in Toronto. No recession here. Depending on what the regulators do, how much money goes into programming and creating good programming, uh, we could have a hell of a business. The theory is that we can't afford to go out anymore, so we'll all stay at home watching pay TV. Fine, but getting it can be complicated and expensive. If you want to get pay TV, this is the first thing you have to get, basic cable TV service. But you also need to get a converter to get the extra channels, and that's where it gets complicated. You may already have a converter, but it will not work for pay TV. That's because it looks like this, there's a gap in here, and what you need is one of these new ones, which has this extra module in it, which is a de-scrambler that will unscramble the scrambled pay television signals as they come from the cable company. Now, there are two things you can do. Either you can rent one of these new converters with the de-scrambler from the cable company, or if you already have a converter, you can get what they call an add-on unit. That is one of these black boxes. It's just a de-scrambler, and you can slip that under your existing converter if you have one. Now, there are two obvious problems with all of this. The first is that if you have one of those fancy new televisions with a built-in converter, you're out of luck. The entire internet thinks your mother is dead? What is the source of this falsehood? And what photo are they using? Unclear and primarily a headshot from the 90s. The Olympic Winter Games are coming to CBC, Canada's Olympic Network. This is new video just into our newsroom from Toronto's Pearson Airport of the emergency crews on the tarmac after a Sunwing aircraft clipped a WestJet plane. The Transportation Safety Board confirmed this hour that it is sending a team to investigate. Oh, and you can see there the fire that broke out after the WestJet plane was struck. Sunwing says there were no passengers on board their plane, but on the WestJet flight, 174 passengers and crew all having to escape by emergency slide. They say they're all safe, though one member of the Toronto Pearson Fire and Emergency Service was injured and has been taken to hospital. We do have some heartbreaking details tonight about an elderly couple found dead in southwestern Ontario on Wednesday. The bodies of 90-year-old Grant Tribner and his 83-year-old wife Ada were found on their rural property. He suffered a heart attack, and when his wife came out to check on him, she was overcome by the extreme cold. The goal is to open the armory as, a city's, as the city's seventh respite centre for Monday morning. And up to 100 more shelter spaces will soon be opened in Toronto, but as you heard, not by this weekend when dangerously cold temperatures are in the forecast. The federal government agreed to temporarily open the Moss Park Armory, hoping to have it up and running by Monday, but by then the temperature is expected to climb back up to about 3 degrees. Of course, even after this dangerous cold snap passes, reality for the homeless will remain desperate. A simple truth that inspired a Hamilton, Ontario man to step up. Roger Boyd started feeding and clothing people in his city last year on top of holding down a full-time job. Late last year, we took a tour with Hamilton's homeless helper. My name is Roger Boyd from Man Street Ministry, and we feed the homeless in Hamilton. Wow. I said to uh, my wife, Janet, I said, when I get home, I'm gonna clean out my clothes, take my clothes down to the street. I went down and I met a guy and all he wanted from me was a hug and that was it for me. People give me used clothing. They give me food donations like turkeys, meatballs, canned goods. Look at all this amazing donation. Look at all these coats. How many coats did you guys buy us? You know what, we lost track. You lost track. <laughs>
I got a call from a guy today and he says, Raj, I'm really in desperate need of a pair of size 10 boots. And uh, I told him we're gonna be out on Wednesday. I just came to get the, the bread from upstairs. I'm, all I'm trying to do is be a good neighbor to my community. And my community is amazing. My community has supported me from day one. My expertise is making soup and loving the guys on the street. Peanut butter. <laughs> and keeping everything organized. Uh, I have approximately about 12 uh, volunteers on a regular basis that uh, help me every week. We need another bowl, Roger. It just started out to be, you know, taking our clothes down and then, you know what, we started making soup and then I became known as the soup guy on the street and it just led from one day to two days a week and uh, now we're going out three to four days right now. My ministry is not, it's not about the cup of soup anymore. It's beyond the cup of soup. My ministry is about mental health awareness. This is the coldest day we've had. So I, I only have this much space, so I have to manage it well. So no shoes tonight, no running shoes. Blankets, take all the blankets I got and the majority of the coats that I got. Blankets. I've been preparing the guys uh, for this cold weather. Coats. I've given out about 300 winter coats already uh, this year. I've given out over 150 hoodies. Right there, buddy. Okay. Some people actually picked me up some winter boots, which actually helps out beautifully because uh, there's supposed to be some snow coming next week here, right here. Okay, you got all your stuff? Here, I'll give you a hand. There's a new coat right there. Hey, buddy, what's going on? Hey, how you doing, dude? You want a sleeping bag? Here you go, bro. Okay, you want a blanket too? How about a hat? Want a hat? God bless you, Merry Christmas. Anybody else for a blanket? I'll give you a pair of winter socks though, here. Okay, here's some soup. Here. Okay, words of encouragement rather than just barking at you and you know, have you right prepared. Yeah, nice. Really is good. Cheers, Jeff. Okay, you're welcome, buddy. Okay. What's up, buddy? What do you need, a hat? The city doesn't care about the homeless people and they just ignore it or like freaking pretend like we don't exist. Yeah. Okay. Okay? Okay, good luck, buddy. Be careful, it's hot. Look at that, we're nearly out of clothes. Holy mackinac. I thought that I had to have a lot of money to start a charity, but I was wrong. I thought I had to have, win a lottery to buy a trailer and buy a, a big truck. But I didn't. God showed me that I was all wrong. All I had to do was start it. Well, a nice story. And I'll bet a lot of people across the country are thinking of people that they know who do similar things. Uh, and it shows how just a few small things, hats and blankets and soup, can, can make a big difference. Huge difference, especially on a night like this one. Listen, that is the National for January 5th. Good night. Good night. Good night.